Hello everyone and thank you for watching tonight. The 3D Game Lab Teacher Camp is proud to present Playing It Safe, Modeling and Practicing Citizenship Through Play. Tonight's uh, speaker is Ann Collier and tonight's moderator is Miriam Maelstrom. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Miriam. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and I want to say a big thank you to uh, both you and Kay for hosting this event tonight. And I am so pleased to have with us um, Ann Collier, who is a journalist and a youth advocate who's been following online activities of youth since, and you always have to help me with this. Like 1997? <laughs> yes, it's uh, a long time. Yeah, for a long time. And um, Anne's work has been really instrumental in um, shaping the work that we have been doing at the Elizabeth Morrow School, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, I. We are going to be posting her full bio on the YouTube channel after this is over, but uh, some of the highlights, uh, and there are, there are so many, is that she, um, besides journaling and uh, following the research um, on online safety and, and youth activity, uh, for all of these years, she was appointed, uh, and I have to bring up the bio because I never get this right. I'm going to turn this over to you, and to, to give some of the highlights so we get, yeah. it, we get it right. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> I've just been doing this a long time, really, as a journalist and, and not an online safety advocate, but a youth advocate. And I really make a distinction between those two things. But um, just because I thought I was late to the game, you know, after the Supreme Court struck down the Communications Decency Act back in 1997. Um, I wasn't. It turned out that I was kind of doing this early on and somehow got involved in a couple of national task forces about youth online safety and I've just been kind of following this fascinating subject that, uh, you know, that has been pretty dysfunctional in a lot of ways through the years and is finally getting more rational. It's really an interesting thing to see, but what has kept me inspired and excited about it through the years is following educators and what they're doing, especially in digital environments in school, which of which I'm also a tremendous advocate. So I really love to follow the work of people like Marianne Malmstrom because it just keeps me going. <laughs> so. Talk, talk to us about that, Marianne. Well, I will, and you were very humble because uh, you, you didn't tell people that you were co-chairman of Obama's committee on uh, online safety back in 2009, 2010, and um, that report really had an impact on uh, our work. But um, I want to back up a little bit because, um, and I'm so excited that we're bringing this conversation to 3D Game Lab because everybody who are, uh, is involved in taking these courses and uh, working together, we're really interested in making education more relevant by looking at game-based learning and, and how that can enhance um, education. And, you know, in our school we were doing everything we could, but um, and I, I remember being so afraid uh, back when I started doing technology because there was so much fear. And um, when I came across your work and your research, your report, not your research, but the re you were reporting on the research, it was so liberating to kind of be able to exhale and know that we didn't have to be worry about, worried about a predator around every corner. And yeah. it just gave us some freedom to really dig in and, and start looking at um, how we could help our own students get online. and. Um, one of the things that really surprised us um, is that even though we had a really good, um, we had a really good program. We thought it was good to teach online safety. We were seeing this huge disconnect between what we were, you know, teaching the kids and the reality. We would have kids come in and do things online they would never do it in real life, um, and. In, in some cases we had kids get kicked from the scratch community for both their uh, language to other students and because they were um, claiming other people's work and we were just couldn't we couldn't quite um, reconcile that because they were good kids and you know in, in real life they would in real life in, in face to face they would have never done that and of course in real life they did 
but we were seeing that they did under they didn't quite understand or there was a disconnect that those were humans on the other side um, and the uh, when your report uh, the report that you worked on came out in um, 2010 it was a report to Congress what really struck me is um, that your recommendations in that report were the connection between civilized behavior leading yeah. to safe behavior and also your recommendations that every school um, both have uh, incorporate a, a program for uh, citizenship and also use the actual tools and that was so helpful in uh, us thinking that we have to stop teaching citizenship and use these spaces we were already exploring for learning because we were already had kids in Second Life and we had kids in Quest Atlantis and we were moving that direction but it really crystallized the need to create these spaces so kids could practice citizenship like we do in school and at home you know through everyday living um, and that was kind of the seed uh, that really set us on the, this journey where we've been um, looking at this over the last uh, I would say intensely over the last two years and also forming game programs for younger kids where the norms are still you know they you can stay <laughs> they're still pretty flexible and uh, being involved in uh, designing programs to do that so um, I, I'm going to have you uh, speak to some of the research that um, I have focused on and um, and then maybe come back and talk about uh, how that has been interpreted in our program and then um, maybe have a little conversation and then absolutely open it up to our participants tonight to pick your brain and talk about what it could mean to them in terms of when they design their game-based programs and this very real uh, piece of it that is not that I'm not seeing in the conversation uh, as of yet, but we're hoping to change that. Well, okay then. Let me just switch over to PowerPoint here. And we'll get started. Come on. <laughs> Okay. Apologize for the delay, people. It's just not happening. Actually, we can see your desktop right now, so go ahead and click on the PowerPoint and open it up. Oh, thank you, Chris. There you go. Okay. Okay. Um, the report that Marianne was referring to was the report of the Online Safety and Technology Working Group. And that um, was a result of, you know, it's so complicated, anything involving the federal government, right? But um, we were charged by a federal law called Protecting Children in the 21st Century Act to study the state of online safety in four different areas for a whole year. And one of those areas, I won't go into all of that, but one of those areas was the state of online safety education. And that's where we kind of looked at um, the public discourse about this and what was being taught um, over the past, gosh, at that point it was about 12 or 13 years, maybe even 15 years, and um, concluded that what really needs to happen is that... Um, digital literacy and citizenship needs to be taught pre-K through 12 through the core curriculum um, as kind of baseline online safety. If you sort of look at a tiered model of the, you know, stealing from public health, there's there are three tiers. There's primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary is universal, and it's really kind of a prevention education, right? And this is true we found in online safety that um, if literacy and citizenship and um, you know, just these basics are taught, that goes a long way. We've also found just in the past year, this wasn't a finding of the Ostwig is what it was called, that, that task force, um, that social emotional learning is actually represents the lion's share of bullying prevention. So 
Um, now let me just tell you a little bit more about this whole um, what safety has to do with citizenship, right? Um, citizenship, you, it, back in 2007, I found this in Archives of Pediatrics. It was a, an online safety or youth online risk study that had been done by mostly by researchers at the University of New Hampshire at the Crimes Against Children Research Center. And one of the things they said is that youth who engage in online aggressive behavior are more than twice as likely to report online interpersonal victimization. So it's kind of common sense, right? What goes around comes around. Those who engage in aggressive behavior online are more than twice as likely to be victimized online. So being nice, being able to function well with your peers in community goes a long way toward keeping you safe. And we also found in, in um, the first task force I served on, the Harvard Berkman task force that was put together by 49 state attorneys general, um, there we did a complete review of the literature under the guidance of Dana Boyd and we looked at both the youth online risk literature and to some extent the social media research. And we made these four really key findings that really represented a turning point even though some of the attorneys general tried to um, kind of discredit these findings because um, they didn't line up with what the attorneys general wanted to hear. But um, what we found um, from this review of the peer-reviewed literature is that the number one risk that, or the most salient risk that kids face is online harassment and cyberbullying. And yet, only about 20 to 25 percent of kids ever experience cyberbullying. It's far from an epidemic. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's really hyped up. And this past year, we've heard a lot about it in the news. And um, really false, um, almost dangerous associations with suicide have been made. And this is not helpful to kids, um, the experts tell us. So, um, but it is important to know that not predators, but um, peers are, you know, the most common risk that children face, but they are stakeholders in their own well-being and that of their peers online. Um, we also found that not all young people are equally at risk and that, um, you know, that it's the kids who are most at risk offline who are most at risk online. There are a whole lot of correlations between risky behavior offline. Um, and what happens online. So basically the, the literature has found that online life, online experiences and activities and sociality are embedded in offline life, in everyday life. And to a great extent that's school, right? Um, and then this one was really huge. The third one that a child's psychosocial makeup and home and school environments are much better predictors of online risk than any technology a child uses, whether it's a game or it's a cell phone or it's a social network site, you know, it you can you can name any technology, and what you'll find is what's going on in a kid's head and in a kid's life that predicts risk or well-being. So, um, so can I just interrupt yeah. you? There? I just want this to clarify that so it has nothing to do with the technology. What the study says is how that child behaves in real life is pretty much what you're going to see how they behave online, no matter what tool. Yeah, is that correct? A, yeah, how a child feels about him or herself, how he deals with his peers, how his life is going, how his grades are, how much sleep he's getting. All of that is a much better predictor of how well he or she is doing online than any technology he or she's using. Um, that's huge. That's, that is huge. You know, technology itself can be a risk factor. It can augment problems. It can perpetuate problems. Um, you know, when cruelty is, you know, spread around a bit, social cruelty or aggression is spread around a bit, copy and pasted. You know, when people get into arguments, when mistakes are made. Um, you know, th things happen that technology can make more problematic and it's hard to escape it, right? People talk about sort of the 24-7 nature of cyberbullying. 
um, it's you know if if it's on your phone it's hard to put away um, so but technology is not the cause technology is not causative and then you know that fourth one was really about um, our response to the attorneys general who really felt that age verification they prescribed age verification as the solution to online risk um, really just zooming in on the predation risk um, that had been overblown because we were in the middle of a predator panic in 2006 and um, you know I don't have to go into all the details but what we found is that no single um, technology can solve the problem either it's neither the cause nor the solution um, really the solution is in our lives, yeah, our everyday lives. And so what happens in home and school um, is, is really the context for whatever happens online. What happens online is like the tip of an iceberg. And we often have to just go a little bit deeper um, to find out what's really going on, not rely on what we see on a Facebook page or in you know, the comments under an Instagram photo to figure stuff out. We gotta talk with our children. Um, so you know the next task force I served on um, made all of these recommendations to Congress, there's a whole lot of them, but the two most important ones to my mind were to make digital citizenship and literacy instruction um, ubiquitous in this country, to make it a national priority. Um, you know at the secondary and tertiary levels we can do, we can do very specific bullying prevention work. We can have programs we can and then social workers and mental health care professionals at the tertiary level can do both prevention and um, intervention work in the tools that children know and love but at the baseline level these um, you know literacy social media and digital literacy are um, a major protection when we understand how to use the tools properly, when we understand how to be good to one another, when we start developing norms of behavior in digital environments, th this is what citizenship, you know, there is no definitive definition. We're really needing to crowdsource digital citizenship because digital citizens are all over the world and we all have different perceptions of what citizenship means but what I've picked up in um, my travels um, different conferences reading various types of research um, these are the elements that I've picked up on and you know what's very important to educators special especially social science educators is civic engagement right preparing our children for um, engagement and participation in social action and um, what's happening in our societies and our um, governments going forward online and offline and you know the um, rights and responsibilities that we have we focus so much on um, the right to be safe but we also have other rights that are enshrined really in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child the right of free expression, the right of association. Children enjoy these rights as well and we need to think about the implications of those rights online as well as offline and also a sense of belonging or community. Um, we, need to, we need to think about what online community means and does and we need to bring online community into the school environment because it's really hard to teach citizenship without opportunities to practice it or digital citizenship in digital environments just the same way that it's really hard to teach swimming without a pool. <laughs> Great, I'm gonna Bye. just interrupt you for just one second to address a couple of things and, and um, I just want everybody to know that we are gonna make these slides available uh, for you and we're already getting a slew of questions about um, the research which is important we, and we are going to have a chance to open that up for discussion but I just want uh, our participants um, to think about what this means all of this research means in terms of these game-based programs that we are um, developing for our classrooms because so often we are so focused on the very rich 21st century skills that we identify as collaboration and cooperation and problem solving and all of those things that are very rich and we focus on the assessment but I think we're missing this whole huge piece uh, that really speaks uh, that we're all concerned about whether we're teachers or parents or students is really what does all this mean in terms of uh, 
being safe online and being civil and being able to function in this um, in this uh, new world of ours. And, and I just think this research is so beautiful in in uh, showing this, and it's really uh, an opportunity where we're talking about research meeting practice. And so as you're listening to this, think in terms of the programs that you're already running or that you're designing or that you would like to design and what that means. And let's uh, keep going. This is so fabulous, Anne. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate your making it relevant <laughs> to our audience, Marianne. Thanks so much. Um, you know, we 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 think of digital citizenship as a new thing, and I think it's really important to um, just sort of pull back and understand that there's very little about it that's new. It's not rocket science. It doesn't take you know hours of professional development to grasp. It doesn't take a special course to teach children, especially if it's all theory. Um, if it's not um, put into practice in a digital environment, I can't imagine how engaging it would be or how um, effective it would be in influencing behavior. So um, I was thinking about what all that I've learned about, um, you know, from game designers and educators as well as from the youth online risk research and, you know, what are the elements that we need to teach it? Well, these elements are elements we've had all along in, you know, education educational spaces. Um, the infrastructure is sometimes a classroom, but it can also be a wiki or a blog or a Google Doc. Um, it can be a digital environment or um, an offline environment. And um, it's just the infrastructure that you need um, that also provides a kind of set of values or philosophy um, that undergird the behaviors that we're trying to model and practice. So infrastructure is a key pillar and then also opportunities to practice because really citizenship is a verb, right? You know, the more opportunities we have to practice it, to, to um, learn how to function well in a community of any kind and to, to practice social literacy, um, the, the better. The better we get at it, um, and it really helps to have guidance—the kind of guidance that classes have always had in their teachers in um, classrooms—and that goes for digital environments as well. And then one that I've added recently that I have learned from people like Scott Nicholson at Syracuse University um, is agency. Um, Jane McGonigal talks about this too that you can't really you don't have good conditions for a game without a choice without the player's choice or voluntary interest in participating so you need that sense of agency and I thought I would just go into that just a teeny bit deeper because um, it was a real revelation to me when I went to GLS last June and heard Professor Nicholson talk about how he took a year off from teaching and went to MIT just to study how you motivate people, and um, you know what and and what he did was really distinguished between gaming and gamification, and um, by gaming he meant meaningful gaming. He meant you know that which um, has lasting effect and lasting engagement for people, um, and and what he found is that you really have to be player centric you you have to have a sense of agency or autonomy in that space you you have to create um, and or be sure that the material the play or whatever is relevant related to meaningful to the person's life the person's interests and you have to build in a sense of competency or efficacy and this is definitely true in the online safety space as well you you need to move young people from being mere consumers of media, which they no longer are, but which many adults think of them as. Um, I even I remember a common sense media study that I just saw that um, was riddled with the words consumer and actually referred to all media that children use as um, um, entertainment media yeah. rather than the kind of serious work and production that kids engage with media to do. Um, so a sense of competency or efficacy 
um, is really key. There, were, there was some research done by the Good Play Project at Harvard at the School of Education there, led by Howard Gardner, um, that found um, that kids lack a sense of efficacy in their use of um, online um, media and um, digital technologies. That, and, and they also have a sense that their media is inconsequential. And I thought, oh my gosh, of course. We have been telling them for a decade and a half that they are potential victims online. Mm -hmm. We have been taking away their sense of control and competency and not been stressing how important they are um, in, in their, to their own safety and that of their peers and their communities. In user-driven media, um, they are stakeholders in the, the safety of everybody concerned. And this has to be the message in a classroom, in a digital environment, um, and in society in general. It's really key. So. Yeah, this is key. And I, I think we're going to get into this just a little bit later about what that looks like in the classroom. That is so important. Yeah, I can't wait for Marianne to talk about that because um, I've observed her classrooms and I am so excited by what I see. The respect that, that, that children are showing for each other and that the teachers are showing for their students. So, you know, that's just another way of saying that um, it's really hard to, to, to teach something without having the tools that we're talking about. Um, to teach it with, whether it's cooking in a kitchen, you got to have a kitchen. You can't just sort of work in in pure theory. So I, I think I'm just going to skip through these. This this will be. Um, we have to be thinking about what what's in it for us citizens, uh, and I think that's really important. And we have to be thinking about um, what the literacies are in social media use and and making the case for bringing these digital environments into school. Um, but I just thought I'd sort of end with. One of the things that, or a group of things that I've been learning from um, game designers about um, online safety, and that there really is a lot that um, the my field can learn from good game design. You know that we need to play and engage with our kids in social media, have a little fun, let them play with being our tech support while we teach them the literacy in and out of media, and focus on the people involved in media experiences more than the media themselves. Um, I just remember Marianne was with me at, at Univers University of Wisconsin when we heard um, Dutch PhD scholar Sebastian Detterding say in his keynote that it's the nature of a fun community to care more about the players than about the game. If we're having fun, we're caring. So lighten up means that you know we can really engage and have fun and the community becomes really important. It greases the wheels, right? And then we need to release control. Control doesn't motivate, we, I learned from Dr. Nicholson. Um, what motivates is agency. And we, so we need to support autonomy and we need to create a space that the, the safety that we're really talking about here is psychological safety. Being allowed to mess up to do the trial and error, to fail, to, to win, to level up. These, these are elements of safety. That, this is sort of the real safety of digital environments, right? Um, and then, you know, model what we want to see. Um, rules never work if they're, you know, just for the kids. We have to, we, the rules are for all of us. And it's really a good idea to think of them in terms of artistic constraints, right? That's what makes things really interesting in the play. Um, they're shared values, not just rules. And rules um, are better for creativity, you know, when they're, they're, they give a sense of definition. So um, there's an urge to problem solve together. So this, you know, what's really interesting is good game design, good game play is also good safety. So that's really it. Uh, that's uh, that's really it. <laughs> we just say that that's, so simply. We have funny. had so many great questions coming in, and um, all, fabulous! You, you're as always really igniting everybody. Um, I have to say though, um, I I've been following. I I don't know what we met back in two thousand eight or nine. I I heard 
you speak for the first time in Second Life, and I tried to record it, and we had epic fail. And you were so sweet. I, I called you up. I said, I really need to record this. And we did a machinima, and you re, uh, recorded your whole speech. So that is online, and we've done it several times since. So um, on the um, 3D Game Lab event page, I've left a link that of uh, resources that I give my parents. and. Um, the report that we're talking about, uh, as well as a lot of those machinimas uh, of your earlier talks, and uh, uh, are are all available. So I'm going to make um, a plea for you to go to uh, for our listeners to go there to get into the specifics because it's fascinating, and I've been following your work very closely ever since. And, and sometimes it's a hard to wrap your brain around so much good information and what that means. But what I really want to get across to the group tonight is this piece that I think that we're missing that has been so uh, profound in shaping our program at our school and talking a little bit about that and what that looks like. And I do have a few slides and one of them is the summary of the Ostwood report which is, um, and I'm not giving the title right, let me just bring that up. To... There are some good questions here. Wow. There are some good questions. So you can look at some of those as I'm bringing this up. And um, I'm just going to go over this really briefly some of the highlights of where that research has met uh, practice in, in our school. And um, then hopefully get into some of the questions about what does this mean in terms of us bringing games, game-based learning, virtual worlds, emojis into the classroom, and why this is so important. So the name of the report uh, that we are talking about that went out to Congress, and I love the report, the name is Youth Safety on a Living Internet. And uh, I just picked some of the recommendations that really resonated with me, was avoid the scare tactics tactics and promote social norms, which has been, I think, um, one of the key cornerstones to our program is the social norming. Uh, and the digital citizen talked about being from pre-K to 12, when often we're only focusing on it in our middle school and high school and thinking of it in terms of Facebook and those kids. And that's, nothing could be far farther from the truth, and that we have to uh, focus on the new media, which is what you're talking about, bringing the pool into school. Uh, it's got to be integrated into our regular uh, in instruction. It's got to be organic, the way we, we uh, talk about citizenship or the way we correct kids in real life. We never put them on the couch, right, and say, now when you go out today and cross the road, this is what I want you to do. You teach it in context every time you cross the road. and. Um, and the last piece, which I think is really important in context of what we're doing, is respect young people's expertise and get them involved in the teacher and teaching and mentoring. And I think that that's why we're finding such success with uh, platforms like Minecraft, because it lends itself so beautifully to do that. And we started on this journey. We, I have to tell you that, uh, or, or that we've been, we were using virtual worlds and MLGs before. Um, I came across uh, your work, and we were looking at it for the, the learning. But um, when after I read the Ostwig report, I thought we really have to start focusing younger. And we had already been using um, Quest Atlantis, but we adopted Lego Universe for our grades, our third and fourth graders, and and that was really great. And of course, Minecraft, and really the turning point besides understanding that we needed to practice, put into practice uh, or create a place, a safe place to practice these things um, was, uh, I have to give a nod to Massively Minecraft and, and uh, the wonderful people there because they decided they weren't going to do, uh, lay down any curriculum until they had sat and played with the kids and that has been the other cornerstone of our, the success of our program and it is so hard for teachers to do that because we are so wired to have a lesson plan in a direction and as long as we hold on to that and keep being precious we are 
not going to fully be able to engage in this journey because once I let go of that and sat down and played with the kids, a whole world was opened to the learning that they're natively doing online anyway. And it just shifted our whole focus from we're going to teach you what this looks like to show me what it looks like in your in your world and let us step in there and be part of that and let's become partners. I'll learn from you. Uh, I'll lend my wisdom to you and it, it was truly transformative and you know it's it's a thing that we all here know that, that play is learning and for citizenship it's that combination combination of play, practice, practice play, iterative play, trying things on uh, little kids play house to interpret, figure out, you know, their their home lives. Kids get older, they play city, they play war, they play, um, you know, they try on all of these things, and it's just a part of processing life. And the community norms. Um, I this is a great little video. I'm not going to play <laughs> play it for you because I know it doesn't uh, go well over the Google Hangouts. But it's just my um, seventh grade guys sitting around talking about you know the fighting that's going on and me telling them I'm not you know you've got to come with, up with a solution because I'm not I'm not the monitor you know you've got to figure out the space and you know they do that but the fighting is a process and we are so uncomfortable with that as adults and it's being able to balance that out and if, if they don't fight if they don't have conflict then you're taking away any opportunity for them to resolve that conflict. And that really, uh, this is such a sad picture, <laughs> it's not fair. This is another great movie, and I, I'm going to uh, try to get those posted and linked for you, where the kids are just talking about... Um, They're amazing. Crazy. And, and the, yeah. I asked them to speak to the fighting, and they all say the same thing. It's hard, it's awful. But you kind of learn that you have to be, you know, you have to be nice, or you're not going to have any friends. And you kind of learn that you can work things out. And um, uh, I will hope to make that available because I think it's really powerful uh, to hear the kids talk about conflict because you know we're not so comfortable with that, and yet that's kind of the crux of everything that we're talking about is when you're giving them the autonomy and you're giving them the uh, the power to and, and the belief that they can work through that and the safety net that if they can't they're still an adult and um, I want to talk just briefly about why we run a 24-7 server I found out recently we're one of the very few schools that do I know that uh, Lucas Gillespie does with his older kids and I, I would bet that it won't be long before the younger kids get on because for us it, they, it was a relentless campaign from both the kids and their parents but we felt it was really irresponsible to introduce a game in school that we knew they would go home and play and not have a safe place to play. And we know schools feel so responsible to make sure that nothing bad happens and that kids are, everything's perfect because nobody wants to take the responsibility. But we felt we were doing our kids a disservice if they didn't have a safe place, that if we introduced this in school and then did give them a safe place to play after school. And what we found uh, by offering this was really, really purely put into practice what we're talking about is that community norms. And, you know, we were, I will admit, it, we were a little surprised that the kids did start to uh, adopt what we were modeling. They were uh, checking each other's behavior. Uh, they were often correcting each other's behavior. If, it, you know, somebody stepped out of line, you know, they would be the ones to um, call other kids and they have uh, things in place to report to us if, if a problem escalates. So we're and you have chat logs, right? We have chat logs. In yeah. fact, right now things are a little tenuous on Marlcraft because <laughs> we're calling them on their um, things that escalated. So from here, you know, we've certainly learned things that I thought I knew, <laughs> but I, I didn't. Um, and you know, like kids share accounts, and they want to use their real names, and um, how those community standards. You, we, you didn't talk about this tonight, but you know, we have about how if you expect bad behavior, you're going to get bad behavior. If you tell your community, hey, you, the truth is, is 
bullying is, isn't that big a deal. That generally you guys treat each other pretty well. That's the reality, right? So um, to have that place to practice those, those standards and to feel good and to have that agency. Actually, Mary Ann, that's what the social norms research has found. Um, a study specifically on bullying in New Jersey schools found that when kids know that very few people, and this was, this was a study done in each school by kids, they participated in it, and they found that in the vast majority, you know, the vast majority of students don't engage in aggressive bullying behavior, and when children know that, they the behavior conforms even more to that perception. So right. perception, you know, sort of um, steers behavior. So it really helps to get the facts out. The facts that most kids don't engage in cruel behavior. Yeah, and we certainly have seen it. And this is the last point that I really want to make before I open this up because I'm just I know people are dying to ask you questions. But what parents need to know and. This, you know, we had had all of our parent nights and, you know, the same parents would come and it was successful as any school program. We've done that, you know, like that. But what happened is once we started doing a game program, it started bringing everybody to the table. And there were some really important things we were discovering we thought parents should know. Like, do you know that your kids are playing all over the place? online? Do you know that your kids are making movies? Do you know that your kids have Twitter accounts? Do you know your kids are Skyping? And so it was bringing some information to them not in a punitive way but in an informative way and and instead of talking at them we be, we've become more part of uh, we've created more of a partnership where we're all in this together. We truly are a village and helping the parents understand that play equals learning, that practice is better than preaching, and that citizen, good citizenship uh, is a bit the best indicator of you know safe behavior online and, and that relationship and how important it is. And we've even started having bring your parent to game day, where we have had brought parents in so they could play with the kids and see firsthand the robust learning that we're all trying to get education and parents you know educators on board and parents on board you know when they sit down and play with their kids and we would take you know the kids would become the teachers and we tell them oh, you can't use your hands but that's nearly impossible and it was so successful and after we you know we, we play with the kids for a while we take the parents aside and answer questions we share things they we think they should know and um, that has just been so healthy and um, you know, parents feel free to call if there's an issue, and, and the dialogues have just been so much more productive, and, and I really feel like we're doing something, or we're growing a model that is, is uh, workable. And um, I'm going to go back now and open it up, because I know people are, yeah, have got questions, and um, Kay, uh, I know you've been doing <laughs> some of those questions. Do you want to chime in and... Um, I know I'm here. I can I can just start reading the questions. <laughs> um, so to start, the first question we were asked are, is, can you address the connection between E-rate funding and strict firewalls? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure what we okay, the 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 federal government, the E-rate funders at the FCC, um, don't. Um, don't dictate how to protect kids. They just say that there has to be filtering, right? The level of strictness um, is up to the school, and schools are self-certifying. So, um, if a school feels that, and I, and I think you know what we've seen from a study out of the UK. Um, um, that it's really better to have instead of strict filtering, especially now that kids are bringing cell phones with web browsers to school, and you know filters just barely protect them from anything anymore. But um, besides that fact, um, you know what what this study found is that moderate filtering in schools is really much more effective because um, children can 
devise strategies for protecting themselves and their classes. They can work with their teachers. Um, they can find stuff or access stuff that is appropriate much better and um, there's just more dialogue around what is and isn't appropriate and really it's the filter in their heads right that we need to develop more than anything else um, the you know that because they have access to an infinite amount of information and they really need to develop that internal cognitive filter I don't know if that helps but um, you know that there has been a change to SEPA recently that requires um, teaching correct behavior online, um, but it it is such a it's very very loosely defined. It really is up to the individual school community. Don't believe anybody who says you have to use my program, my very expensive program, in order to you know maintain your SEPA compliance and get your E-rate funding. Okay, per perfect. And I think that really did address it. Now we have a couple questions on the percentages that you named with cyberbullying. The first one is very straightforward and asks you to repeat the percentage of cyberbullying that that you had in, on your slides. Um, it's there. There's a range. There have been a lot of studies about cyberbullying and. I think one of the best sources there is is the Cyberbullying Research Center, which is basically professors Justin Patchen and Samir Hinduja, um, who've been um, tracking cyberbullying for a number of years now, and they did a complete review of the literature specifically on cyberbullying. And the range was huge, everywhere from 5% had ever experienced it to 70%, but what they found is that most studies ranged um, uh, between 20 and 30 percent. So less than a third, um, a, you know, roughly a quarter of kids have ever experienced cyberbullying is what um, Justin and Samir say. Okay, and some follow-up questions to that real quick. Is there any data differentiating between males and females and is there anything based on socioeconomics? Um, I haven't seen any socioeconomic differences. Um, as far as the the literature has kind of varied a bit on males and females, um, generally saying that boys engage in physical bullying more than girls and girls in cyberbullying more than boys. But um, recently, that has evened out, according to Justin and Samir. So. I, I don't think there's a lot of difference between boys and girls and I think what we have to be really really careful with is the definition of cyberbullying. The Crimes Against Children Research Center at UNH um, is, is really trying to um, help us all get a handle on what exactly it means. It's not just mean behavior online and when kid, a kid is subjected to you know something mean um, you know, people are really, really concerned. They think that suicide might be, be in the offing, and that is just a real disservice to children and parents and the public in general. So we have to be very clear on what we're talking about. People throw everything under the label cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next question. What kind of relationship is there with parent involvement and risky behavior? Oh, I was hoping we'd get to that. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I love what um, Marianne was talking about, of, you know, having, bringing the parents in and having the kids teach the parents. There are actually two fantastic researchers in, at the University of Western Sydney in Australia who are doing that. They call it the living lab. And um, they actually observe what happens when young people teach parents about their social media use and how it all works. and. Um, but anyway, um, there are a lot of correlations between aggressive behavior online and um, kids experiencing aggressive behavior at home, right? Um, same with domestic violence, same with um, substance abuse, um, that, that the more um, risky behaviors ki are, that are modeled for kids or that kids experience or exposed to offline, the, they they tend to experience it more online as well, um, but generally speaking, 
when people talk about risky behavior online and those correlations, they're talking more about predators and predation and um, sexual victimization or sex sexual exploitation. But it's really important to know that sexual exploitation has actually gone down about significantly, about 60% yeah. over the past 15 years, over the period that we've had the World Wide Web. So, um, and that actually isn't in a, a just released Justice Department report about um, kids experiencing violence, which I thought was really interesting. But anyway, um, predation is not the problem that it was made out to be late in the last decade. Does that help at all? <laughs> oh, I think it does. And actually, it plays into the next two questions. One was, how does Google and other social media that require real identification relate to keeping children safe online in terms of, of privacy? Great question. Well, safety and privacy are mashed up together a lot, but they kind of are a little different. Um, I think what we find is that well-lighted spaces online, when kids don't have a lot of supervision or guidance, which Henry Jenkins at USC has said kids have had very, very little of um, because we've vilified social media so much and been in denial about it and kept it out of school. Children have been kind of left on their own in social media spaces, which, which isn't that great. But those that are well lighted and have sort of real name cultures and um, a lack of anonymity. Um, we kind of find are a little bit safer for kids. They are who they say they are and they're accountable for their behavior because everybody knows who they are. Um, Facebook is, is really kind of a place where you hang out with your existing friends. There's a new, and, and there were some problems with MySpace because kids could have different screen names and they could um, impersonate celebrities or be who they weren't and weren't as accountable. So I think there, there's sort of a safety correlation there between um, less anonymity and more accountability. Um, as far as privacy goes, um, that's a huge subject. Um, I'm, I'm, I hardly know where to start, but I think, you know, one of the things that we have to teach our kids is that no matter how strict their privacy settings are set, um, and it certainly doesn't hurt to use the strictest settings and to you know just you know limit your um, online socializing to people you know in real life um, but no matter how strict the settings are friends can you know who become ex-friends or in a fit of anger can you know copy and paste something out well beyond where those privacy settings have any impact and um, mess things up for you and so you know we can't develop a false sense of security about any sort of privacy measures that we find in place through technology. Technology is not the solution. Technology can help but it's not the solution if that answers the question. I think it does. Now the next question is do you advocate having the same access for all students K through 12 mm. or different access for different ages? Well, I think I think um, different ages or stages of child development have different levels of appropriateness. And I am not a child development expert, but what I hear from some experts is that um, it it's helpful for little children to play in walled gardens or, you know, have um, safe kids browsers in place or have a lot of super a lot more supervision um, but you need to kind of release that supervision and control um, in you know in ways that are appropriate as they grow and ideally there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution for all kids of a specific age because some kids are developmentally ready for more socializing than other kids of the same age so um, no, I don't advocate you know the same kind of access to kids of all ages. Okay, so so this looks like the last question. 
Sometimes there is a concern on a school district's behalf regarding lawsuits. Is there <laughs> any data to indicate that this is a rare occurrence? Hmm, I don't have that data. I know that that's probably the you know, uh, overriding fear in most cases. And does it ever come up at the Elizabeth Morrow School, Marianne? Uh, yeah, I think I think fear has always uh, been a factor. It's o it's only been when I uh, and I I say I, but that's not true because we've had a really remarkable team who've been willing to kind of push past that for the the greater good. And and so many times I've been fearful but my need to kind of follow the learning was greater and so many times uh, I have been rewarded by realizing that that fear is actually could be doing more damage. Uh, I mean we've had, there have been lawsuits uh, because people have restricted phones or principals have gone through phones and so you know I, I, I think one could fear that we could be sued because we don't prepare kids for the world they live in. I mean, you could take that argument somewhere else. I, I think the whole thing that we do a 24-7 server, um, you know, has been, was a little controversial with some of um, our parents because uh, if you don't know Minecraft, a lot of people say kids are addicted to it. And that could be a whole different uh, discussion, but what I tell my parents is, well, turn off the computer. I mean, we had to ban it at our school outside of the lab because, you know, little, you know, kids, that's what adults are for, is to help kids set limits when they can't themselves. And uh, the reason we do a 24 7 is uh, I have become very respectful of how well kids navigate online. And if I turn off my server at 10, I don't know where my kids are going. And I do know I have kids that will be going somewhere else. And I do have kids anyway that hop, but at least I know that we have provided a safe place for them and we can monitor when they're logging on, that I can have conversations with their parents to say, you know, really need to think about taking that computer out of the room. And, it, and it's not about me monitoring individual kids, but creating a community of understanding about how kids are living online. So. It's tough. I mean, there are no guarantees, but I think uh, as adults, we have the world's changing, and we have to be willing to be flexible with that if we're going to meet the needs of our kids. I think you. I think we all find that the less of a sense of community you have, the greater uh, possibility there is for lawsuits. You know, the more families are engaged in, and, and you know, it's easy for me to say you know I don't work in a huge district with lots and lots of schools um, but I I just think more and more if we can try to work from you know small to big from the kid out from the classroom out from you know start small experiment document what happens and what we learn from the process and then we have something to show that it really is better to keep the server open 24-7 and to put the onus on parents to make kids go to bed. Um, you know, things like that, if we can document those and share them um, within this community, the better off we'll be and the better we'll be able to make a case with district officials or superintendents. Uh, will we be attending GLS? Or games and education summit. We hadn't uh, thought about that, have we? <laughs> we we did last year. Yeah. Um, I don't know what we'll be doing. We'll be at ISTE this year. Uh, we'll be doing a panel with Lucas and Peggy and Bron Stucky Stucky. I always say her name wrong. I'm sorry, Bron. And uh, carrying on this conversation, uh, as we hope that you will, and and that's really my parting word. I, the there's a couple of benefits here, and one of the practical uh, benefits is that I, I know you're going to your school districts and to your parents and trying to let them understand why uh, having these platforms in school and why doing these kinds of activities are really important. So we hope that you under, you know that this will give you more information to have those conversations intelligently intelligently, but more importantly, you kids really need us advocating for this piece.
uh, it's not understood. It's, um, and I think we need to start changing the conversation so that we can truly help our kids be um, more civil and more safe and, and develop healthier norms online. And we need to do it younger. I mean, we really need to, uh, I know you're working at all different ages, but this really needs to be going down into the grade schools. And Anne, I'm going to turn it over to you for your parting uh, wisdom. <laughs> Oh, I think I think it needs to be younger too. Obviously, I helped write those recommendations, and but I think it's just logical and intuitive that you know we we provide guidance and care and presence with little ones the minute we put a connected device into their little hands. Um, you know, not just those who you know when they enter fourth grade or something because. They're online younger and younger, and there's actually a really fantastic report that I just told Marianne about that I just really dug into over the weekend from the Joan Gans Cooney Center about kids um, under 13 and how little we know about how they mm -hmm. use social media. And um, this report really gathers everything we do know so far and sets a research agenda um, for um, learning more going forward. But What's wonderful is they dug into some really great um, kid-centric properties that, um, and, you know, online properties and games and um, sites that are useful to, to kids that kids really love and kind of deconstructed a little bit and um, showed us what's possible out there. So there's a lot of, there's so much, there's, there's so much gathering evidence of um, how smart it is to um, give children and young people agency and competency and um, it's it's exciting to see because you know now we can start more and more duplicating the kind of work that Lucas and Peggy and Marianne are doing um, all around the country and and you guys thank you so much for coming and thanks for doing what you're doing for children Great place to end. And uh, Kay and Chris, thank you so much for doing a splendid job of hosting this event and yeah. keeping the conversation flowing. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, no problem. Have a great night. <laughs> Good night. Bye.